This How to Do Florida segment is presented by Visit Florida. Thanks to Florida's place in Spain's maritime history, the middle part of the East Coast is littered with Spanish fleet shipwrecks lost while carrying untold riches back to the motherland. So many ships, in fact, this part of Florida has rightly earned the title of the Treasure Coast. Today, we're at Sebastian Inlet in the heart of Florida's Treasure Coast. Sebastian is just an hour and a half southeast of Central Florida. Our guide today, Brent Brisbane, who bought the salvage rights for these waters from the late, great Mel Fisher, an icon in the treasure hunting world. Mel Fisher, ladies and gentlemen. Just 17 days after purchasing the salvage rights, Brent and his crew continued Mel's tradition when they recovered the only bronze swivel gun ever found from the 1715 fleet. Inside were 40 silver and 51 gold coins. Booyah! There were 11 Spanish galleons loaded with treasure. Uh, five of them went to Mexico to pick up treasure, six of them went to South America. They all reconvened in Havana, Cuba. On July 24th of 1715, they set sail for Spain. Seven days later, they're sailing along the east coast of Florida here, hit with a horrific hurricane and all 11 ships were lost, giving us the treasure coast. The reason why all these ships were traveling together, Spain had just ended an expensive war against the English and Dutch. To quickly stabilize its economy, King Philip V ordered as much treasure brought back from the Americas as soon as possible. The loss of these 11 ships began a slow decline of Spain as a world power. So out of those 11, how many have been found? Uh, we believe that six have been positively identified. So there's five ships still out there. That's got to keep you going, right? It absolutely does. We come out here every day hoping that we're going to find the mother load. Step one, position the boat. It's not long before we're over our dive site. The sky's already gold. That's got to be good. But the work is just beginning. What we're going to do right now is we're going to drop a buoy on our location where we would intend to work. We'll then set up the boat in a three-point stance, basically. Uh, there's a bow line, there's two stern lines in a triangular shape. As you go a little bit south. South, west, but straight to the beach. Why we do that is because we've got hydraulic winches on the boat that we can then use to move the boat around to exactly whatever GPS locations we want. And then we begin to excavate, see what we find, and move along. While the boat gets set up, Brent gives me a sneak peek at the world of high-tech treasure hunting. Oh, wow, what is this? Here's what I was telling you about out there. This is our mapping system. We use this computer. It's tied into our GPS. And what you see here is a map of our wreck site. And where you see all these colors, all that blue is silver, the red is gold, and these are d different excavations. Each one of these circles that's empty is an empty hole. So how do they clear the sand to find the gold? An ingenious device called a mailbox, developed by Mel Fisher himself. This device blows prop wash directly into the sand, clearing it for the treasure hunters. All we're doing is moving sand. A day or two later, the sand moves right back over the area and covers back up the spot that you, you just dug. Doesn't destroy the reef, doesn't do nothing. Just blows the sand away, get the bedrock, and then it comes back after a day or two. We dust the hole out. You know, we watch basically the color of the water to uh, dictate that, okay, yeah, we pretty much dusted all the sand off in this area, and then we'll back the engines down. You and Bill jump in the water, and uh, we'll see what we can find. <laughs> the fun part. Finally, it's time to get wet. It's a hot detector. Ready for the diver. It's really, truly an adventure. It's uh, it's about the thrill of the hunt. It's uh, about recovering artifacts that haven't seen the light of day in 300 years. Today's the day. My dive partner, Bill, he's been treasure hunting for 20 years. Bill's got the metal detector, and he's just kind of trying to cover as much area as he possibly can to determine if there's any, you know, metal in the area. Primarily, obviously, what we're looking for is metal artifacts. We do have artifacts that will not ring on the metal detector, such as porcelains and ceramics. So that's all kind of found visually. But certainly, any of the metals are found through the use of the metal detector. And hey, I'm holding my own, although not hearing much in the way of my metal detector pinging. If individuals are interested in going out and hunting on their own, they can come and they subcontract with my company. This gives them the umbrella of working under my permits. They can go out, they can treasure hunt to their heart's content. Um, and if they find anything, we split what they find 50-50. So what do you think down there, Bill? Um, a, little, a little rocky. We're in an area, though, that you know a lot of coins have been found. Yeah. And we just believe that an area is never completely worked out. A lot of nice places to hide, no hits, huh? We're in a good area, man. Move it over, let's keep going. Let's go. Next hole. Next hole. Treasure diving is very methodical. After 10 minutes of searching and finding nothing, we move the boat 30 feet and
and start the process all over again. We've excavated our first hole, so now we're going to move over and, uh, you know, dust off another area. We repeat this process over and over until we hear that sweet, sweet sound. Ping! Go ahead, Brent, let's dig. It's 80 degrees by 22.677. After three hours on the bottom, I finally get a ping, and this could be big, a big score. Oh, oh I wonder what Fiji is like this time of year. Hey, Phil, come over here. I'm getting a strong hit down here. You good? He's got a hit going right over here. I was amazed at how Bill was able to sift through all that sand, and in no time, he had found my loot. The odds of shipwreck material being found, maybe a one in three shot. The actual odds of finding some gold or some silver are probably more like a one in 10 shot. So I had a good, strong hit down there. I really, I was really excited, boy. There's no feeling like hearing that detector go off in your ear. And it was a fish hook. Oh, man. Sure, it sounded like a gold coin. Chad's learning what the frustration of what it's like to actually sit there and try to hand fan out, you know, these objects that are in the shells and the sand. You can dig halfway to China before you actually find it. And uh, when it's a lead fishing sinker, it's really disappointing. <laughs> Reality was kicking in. Treasure diving was a lot harder than I expected. <laughs> oh my gosh! Gold to blue, silver. This treasure hunting is easy. This treasure hunting is hard. This is not what I had imagined. While Brent and his crew continued to salvage offshore, Jonah Martinez and I decided to try a little beach combing. And on the beach, it's finders keepers. What I do is I, I see a sign or I see something on the on the, the dune. Like that keep off dune sign. And right I there. walk right for it and I swing as far as I can one way and as far back the other way. And I try and make it to where it looks like a snake going up and down the beach. Trust me, looking for metal? Well, it'll test your metal. Then finally a moment of reward. Right there, I gotta hit right here. We just found a gold ring. Now, how common is this? That happens out here. This is uh, not just the Treasure Coast for these wrecks. This is a, there's a lot of tourists here. Everyone's putting suntan lotion on. They're getting in the water. They're getting out of the water. Things come off. It, it, <laughs> it happens just like that. Found more on the beach today than we found out there on the boat. <laughs> Sometimes that's the way it is. After my successful afternoon with Jonah, I returned to Brent's boat where we inventoried the day's haul. This is our loot for the day, Brent. Here it's, it is. It's <laughs> quite uh, a sight to behold. Estimated value? A lot less than the fuel we spent looking for it. These are the three things that I found right here. Yeah. But this is treasure hunting, right? It absolutely is. This is bringing up garbage off the bottom of the ocean. It's just uh, yeah. sometimes when we move that garbage out of the way, there's some treasure underneath. There you go. I guess, you know, honestly, I probably should have shown this to you before you went in the water so you knew what you were looking for. But this is the holy grail right here. Oh my gosh, no way. Well, I was seeing these down there all over the place. I mean, this is what I was supposed to be finding. <laughs> yeah, I guess I should have let you know in on this before you went in the water. That is an eight escudo. That is the largest denomination gold coin that the Spanish made. And that's probably what, 22 carat? What is yeah, it? Absolutely. 22 carat? Yep. And that coin was uh, minted in 1711 in Lima, Peru. The historical value here. Absolutely. It's about a 10-time multiple. Uh, the scrap value on that coin is roughly $1,500. The actual value is about $15,000. Well, I know you're supposed to wear your first find. So what do you think? Maybe a, a nose ring or an earring? Or I what can do you stick think that I through your ear right now. Stick that through my yeah. ear? Uh -huh. <laughs> That's good. The great treasure hunter Mel Fisher's motto was, today's the day and it could be your day too. If you have an adventurous spirit and a dream of discovering some sunken loot off Florida's Treasure Coast. We have the only place in the country where, you know, John Q. Public or the average uh, people can live their dream of finding sunken treasure. So check out this stretch of tranquil sands and rich history and gorgeous Sebastian. They're everywhere. And maybe you can land the next coffer of booty on the Spanish fleet of 1715. This How to Do Florida segment was presented by Visit Florida.